Today we're looking at the Apostle Paul, and in order to do that, we're going to look more specifically at the Corinthian correspondence, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and Paul among the Jews and Gentiles, which is about how Pauline scholarship has shifted in the last 30 years, and Galatians and Romans. Jesus is clearly the center and focus of New Testament Christianity. However, we should not underestimate the importance of Paul as a thinker, theologian, and early preacher of Jesus. Is it too much to think of Paul as the primary architect of Christianity? I don't know. He was quite influential, at least. The three New Testament writers generally acknowledged as top-tier theologians are John, Paul, and whoever wrote Hebrews, which is anonymous. Of these, Paul is the most influential. Paul's letters make up nearly one-third of the New Testament. In Galatians and Romans, we see Paul primarily as a missionary theologian. In the Corinthian correspondence, we see Paul primarily as a missionary pastor. These aren't hugely different. Paul was a Jewish missionary and pastor and theologian whose life had been transformed by Jesus. He had a calling from God to preach the good news to the Gentiles. The city of Corinth was a port city with two harbors, one that uh, went toward the west and one that went toward the east. This is a cosmopolitan town, sophisticated, urban. It was a crossroads between the east and the west. There was significant religious and cultural diversity within Corinth. As the Las Vegas of the Mediterranean, the transient nature of its population contributed to its reputation for sexual immorality. Here I want to list what is at least a possible scenario of the various visits and written and oral communication that happened between Paul and the Corinthians, uh, the Corinthian church there. First was the founding visit, about which we can read a little bit in 1 Corinthians 2, 1 to 5, where Paul apparently stayed for about 18 months. Secondly, there was a previous letter referred to in 1 Corinthians 5, 9, and 11 that might consist of 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 7, 1, although I think probably not. And then we have some sort of oral communication from Corinth to Paul and a letter from Corinth to Paul as well referred to in 1 Corinthians 7, 1. And then very likely what we know of as 1 Corinthians. Then came Paul's painful visit to Corinth and a stern letter from Paul to Corinth, which is referred to in 2 Corinthians 2, 3, 4, 9, 7, 8, which is possibly lost or possibly consists of chapters 10 to 13 of 2 Corinthians or maybe less likely 1 Corinthians itself. Then Paul sends Titus to Corinth as his emissary at some point. And then we have a letter of reconciliation from Paul to Corinth that might consist of 2 Corinthians 1 to 9 or much of it. Then Paul hears about further trouble in Corinth. And we have another letter that might consist of 2 Corinthians 10 to 13. And then Paul, at some point, stops there to pick up the collection intended for the saints in Jerusalem and stays about three months. Now, this is quite complicated, and um, it's unclear that this is the best or the correct way that things actually happened. But in any case, you can get a sense of how complicated the various uh, visits and oral reports and written reports going in both ways um, was as a background to the letters that we have. Uh, it's probably impossible to recover with any sort of certainty exactly what happened in what order, but um, at least in this case, we have evidence for quite a complex and extended uh, communication, uh, whether in person or through, uh, through a third person who is visiting, reporting to Paul, or Paul himself. Now I'd like to imagine, if you would, I don't know how, how 
sympathetic you have been toward Paul in the past, but imagine what it was like for him as a pastor waking up one morning and thinking about his to-do list for the day. Let's see, I need to deal with conflict and rivalry in the church and sexual immorality among the church members, theological issues related to sex, virginity, and marriage, people suing other people within the church. Also, I need to deal with whether it's okay to eat food that's been offered to idols. Uh, yes, conflict over spiritual gifts and tongues and prophecy. Yeah, I have to touch on that too. Oh, and the role of women. Oh, uh, and economic and class disparity within the church, even arrogance on the part of some over that disparity. And some other things. And oh yes, how to live holy lives in the midst of a religiously, culturally, and ethnically pluralistic society, all in Christian freedom. Maybe I should go back to bed. Addressing these problems is the problem of or challenge of factionalism. Spiritual elitism led to factionalism, and the Corinthians tended to define themselves by their differences rather than by their common life. This references to uh, the second edition of our textbook rather than the third edition. The overarching issue here is a lack of love in the church. And so it's no surprise that 1 Corinthians is the letter with the love chapter, which let me remind you was intended for congregational life, not weddings. Next time you read 1 Corinthians 13, please think about how this feels when it's written to a congregation who needs love. Um, these are all, I think, will find uh, uh, slogans that Paul at some level affirms but says is, uh, are not enough. Both extremes wanted to avoid ambiguity, possibly also conversation, by reducing norms to slogans. Um, in each case, Paul agrees with the slogan, but then nuances it or limits its application. Note the failure of a loving and edifying discernment process in Corinth. Communication via soundbite or slogan is just totally in insufficient. And this is so chillingly, I think, like what's happening in the Mennonite Church these days. Um, there are several ways to think about uh, the organization or outline of 1 Corinthians. I'm going to offer you a couple of them. One is an opening in verses 1 to 9, and then response to problems identified in an oral report to Paul. And occasionally Paul will say, well, now concerning, going on to the next issue. This uh, runs from 1.10 to 6.8. These include divisions in the community, um, he says in verse 11, it has been reported, and then he goes on to address that issue. Sexual immorality, again, it has actually been reported, that, 5.1. And then members suing members in 6. Followed by response to problems identified in a letter to Paul, 6.9 to 16.12. So he's responding to both of these. One is a theology of the body. One is uh, spiritual gifts, now concerning spiritual matters, actually in the Greek but probably a reference to spiritual gifts, and then <coughs> concerning the collection in chapter 16. Uh, very briefly, concerning Apollos, and then there's a closing. Another way of looking at this is that we have a theology of the body that runs from 6.9 to 11.34. It begins with an introduction uh, with a argument that the body and spirit are one, and then Paul treats sex and marriage in eschatological perspective. And he says, now concerning marriage, now concerning virgins, now concerning food offered to idols, another part of the body. And then two specific body issues. One is head coverings, another is the Lord's Supper. And then he goes on in chapters 12, 13, and 14 to talk about the theology of the church as a, as a body. And we have body uh, metaphors and similes in these chapters. And then finally, a theology of Jesus' body. 
and insofar as it pertains to the resurrection of Jesus as well as the resurrection of believers. And then a closing. Now, in addressing the Corinthians' problems, Paul used theological arguments to correct the practical issues. Examples are divisions in the community are best addressed with a proper theology of the cross. Sexual immorality and questions about sex and marriage is really answered by a proper theology of the body. In other words, Paul didn't go right to this is what you should do and this is what you shouldn't do, but, uh, but he went to how do we understand the larger issues that might help us put some perspective on the ethical issues that we are facing. Or competition on the basis of spiritual gifts. Here we need a proper theology of the body, that is the body of Christ, consisting of multiple differing gifts, all serving the same end. Now that's Paul's approach, but it's not the Corinthians' approach. In, the, in responding to Paul's uh, criticisms, the Corinthians quickly turned the focus on to Paul himself. He became the problem. So people feeling the sting of Paul's correction lashed out at him. As a result, much of 2 Corinthians is in the form of a theological defense. That is, a defense both of his personal integrity and of his gospel. And if you were to ask Paul about this, he would say, well, he didn't see a big difference between the two because to defend the gospel is to defend himself and vice versa. 2 Corinthians is really quite complex in literary and historical terms. Its authenticity, that is, was this actually written by Paul, is not questioned, with the exception of some parts. An example would be 6.14 to 7.1, which seems to contradict uh, what Paul says in so many other places, and even what Paul himself says in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. But its unity, that is, was this letter written um, more or less in the form that it, we have it now, uh, in a particular uh, occasion, uh, is, uh, is questioned and significantly doubted. So, in short, Paul wrote 2 Corinthians clearly. However, this may actually be a composite of several separate um, letters. The distinctive characteristic here is a constant interplay between theology and Paul's personal integrity. The older tendency in biblical criticism was to solve critical problems by positing some kind of literary seams that uh, you have one from an editor and one from a later redactor and so forth. So we can, we can solve uh, problems by saying, well, this, these different parts of the text come from different uh, people or from different situations or whatever. Well, this tendency to solve problems by positing literary seams has persisted longer with 2 Corinthians with good reason. And that is, um, there probably actually is um, a, uh, there probably actually is a uh, stitching together of disparate communication pieces in this letter. In 115 to 213, we have a detailed itinerary uh, that is picked up again in 75. In 214 to 74, we have what appears to be the un most unified section of the letter, except that 614 to 71 interrupts its context with both a distinctive vocabulary and a distinctive theology that could be a later edition, and, and as I said earlier, numerous contradictions of what we read elsewhere in Paul. Now, various people have really tried hard to make sense of 614 to 71 within its context, um, but I haven't been terribly impressed by those attempts, and I, I still think 614 to 71 is a, uh, is a puzzle that we haven't quite solved yet. Although chapters 8 and 9 both speak of the collection, 9-1 sounds like Paul is addressing a new topic. Were these chapters put together later from, from a couple different communications? And although much of 2 Corinthians is a defense, the tone or edge of 10 to 13 differs significantly from the rest of the letter.
Now the issues in Paul's self-defense are, number one, what really are the grounds for Paul's claim to authority? Does he have good grounds for claiming authority? Secondly, Paul's personal psychological and apostolic style. I mean, after all, he's kind of weak, unimpressive, and defenseless in person and, um, and in writing, perhaps. And this leads to a strange combination, at least strange to me, of boasting and repudiation of boasting as unwise. Um, some of this we might have better understanding of if we knew the rhetoric of the time uh, better. For instance, we do know that one of the common things that uh, rhetoricians did at that time was to deny that they know anything about rhetoric or that they're uh, skilled in rhetoric. And then they go on to use their skill in rhetoric to persuade the audience. So that was actually fairly typical at the time. And Paul seems to um, reflect that typical pattern in his own writing. Maybe the same is going on with boasting. But for Paul, the gospel is too precious simply to be the subject of the powers of oratory. And in, in contrast, he says, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Next, we're going to do a little turn to look at some significant shifts in Pauline scholarship in recent decades. And these shifts have become so significant that scholars now tend to speak of an older perspective and a newer perspective. The old perspective is that Romans, or maybe Paul's Gospel, um, especially chapters 1 to 8, are all about how a person is justified through faith in Jesus Christ. The new perspective is that Romans, especially Paul's Gospel, chapters 1 to 8, is about how God's action in Christ applies equally and justly to both Jews and Gentiles. It's a different perspective. It's not that they're incompatible, it's just it's a different way of thinking about it. The old perspective that Romans 9 to 11 represent a parenthetical clarification of the implications of the above for the place of Israel in God's reign. In other words, the primary issue is the anthropological uh, need for which the gospel provides an answer. That is, what, what is the problem? The problem is sin, and the problem is how God deals with sin. But in the new perspective, the problem is um, the, the uh, relationship of Jew and Gentile in the justice of God, and, and actually whether God is just in uh, reconciling Jews and Gentiles. In the new perspective, Romans 9 to 11 represent the climax, even the center of Paul's gospel, probing the implications of Paul's gospel for Israel, understood at least in part as unbelieving Jews. In the old perspective and the new perspective, Romans 12 to 15, explore the ethical implications of Paul's gospel. And in the old perspective, Paul rejected Judaism's idea about how one was saved. But in the new perspective, Paul's gospel extends to the Gentiles the understanding that Judaism had, which is that one is saved through faith by God's grace. Even the Ten Commandments be begin with the word that I am the, the Lord who took you out of the land of Egypt. And... Um, uh, the Ten Words or the Ten Commandments that follow is a response to the saving grace of God in the Exodus. Now John Taves is one uh, voice of the New Perspective and he wrote uh, a, a good uh, commentary on Romans in the Believer's Church uh, Bible Commentary series. He says first Paul is a Jewish Christian apostle to the Gentiles. His fundamental concern is the mission to the Gentiles and the incorporation of Gentiles into the people of God. What are the criteria for participation in the covenant people? Covenant people were defined by circumcision and the proper observance of food and festival laws, often called purity laws. And the central issue facing Paul in the Gentile mission is the implication of Jesus as God's Messiah for the incorporation of Gentiles into the people of God. And the central quest, uh, question here is, must Gentile converts um, 
who are men become uh, Jews or, or women become Jews in order to be part of the covenant people of God, that is, to be Christians. Second, the doctrine of justification is hammered out by Paul in two letters, that is, Galatians and Romans, for the specific purpose of enabling Gentile converts to be full and genuine heirs to the promises of God to Israel without becoming ethnic Jews. In this perspective, by the way, um, Paul is revealed to be really radically inclusive in his theology. And I don't know that we typically think of Paul in those terms, but I think it's a helpful perspective. Paul is a Jewish Christian concerned to see God's promises to Israel brought to complete fulfillment. Jesus is the pinnacle of what God is doing with Israel, not the annulment of it. And this fulfillment requires the incorporation of Gentiles. In Romans, Paul is redefining the people of God to embrace Gentiles as well as Jews. It is about God as the God of Jews as well as the God of the Gentiles. It's about incorporation into the new humanity of Christ over against the old humanity of Adam. Paul is redrawing the boundaries that mark out the covenant people of God. Third, Judaism does not teach salvation by works. Salvation in Judaism is by God's election and by God's grace alone. Obedience to the law is simply the means to maintain covenant salvation, not a means to earn it. Fourth, Romans is a politically subversive letter. Over against the Roman imperial good news that Caesar is Lord, who brings justice and peace to the world, Paul proclaims a different gospel. That is, that Jesus is Lord, and he alone brings righteousness, or justice, which is the same word in Greek, and peace. Jesus, not Caesar, is to be confessed and worshipped. Finally, Romans is read as a pastoral letter addressing specific and concrete pastoral problems and issues among the house churches of Rome. I think we need to talk a little bit about Paul's experience on the road to Damascus. Was Paul converted on the road to Damascus? Well, not if conversion means transition or change from one religion to another. I think it's really important to recognize that Paul did not convert from Judaism to Christianity. Paul's call to be an apostle to the Gentiles was central to his experience on the road. And because of the Centrality of his call to be an apostle, Stendhal, Christopher Stendhal, prefers call over conversion, especially since conversion can be um, misinterpreted as uh, converting from one religion to another. And yet Paul was converted if conversion means a radical realignment of one's life and understanding. Paul's eye-opening experience was positively life-changing in that experience. It is also a call story since Paul's experience on the road cannot be separated from his commission to bring the gospel to Gentiles. In fact, Paul's experience of conversion and call were foundational to his understanding of the gospel. Paul's big about face is that he became convinced that Jesus was the answer, the key to God's saving, saving action in the world. And he spent the rest of his career trying to work out what the questions were that is, how and why Christ is the answer. Now, Christopher Stendhal, who is uh, sometimes credited as one of the architects of the new perspective on Paul, says that Paul had a robust conscience and considered himself flawless. He says, quote, It seems to me that Paul was a pretty good Christian. He may not really have been attractive. He was not a sympathetic sort of fellow. He certainly was arrogant. But he was great, and Paul did not go through the valley of sin and guilt. He went from glory to glory. <clears throat> Stendhal himself wrote an article on the introspective conscience of the West that is one of those articles that, um, that um, is powerful and paradigm shifting and actually uh, made a huge impact on Pauline studies. Uh, Stendhal says, ever since Augustine and Luther, We've been schooled, wrongly, to read Romans as a theological treatise on the nature of faith and sin. Now, lest you think that uh, Stendhal is just anti-Lutheran here, he's a Lutheran himself. He just thinks that um, Augustine and Luther taught us to read Paul in a certain way and that we should unlearn that way. He says, Paul was happy and successful as a Jew, 
As to righteousness under the law, Paul claims in Philippians, he was blameless. That's a pretty big claim. The eye of Romans 7 is rhetorical, Stendhal says, which is exonerated in any case. This is not a heart-wrenching introspection as um, Luther was and Augustine both were um, inclined to think. The function of the law was to serve as a kind of babysitter until the right time. So here's the so what. Stendhal's thesis is that for centuries the West has wrongly surmised that the biblical writers were grappling with problems which no doubt are ours, but which never entered their consciousness. And so we have wrongly imposed our questions and our issues on the text. This actually happens quite a lot, but it's embarrassing to admit it when it happens. Few things are more liberating and creative in modern theology than a clear distinction between the original and the translation in any age, our own included. Now let's look a little bit at Galatians, which is one of my favorite uh, letters to, of Paul. A few questions of introduction. Who wrote it? Paul. There's no question. If Paul wrote any letter in the New Testament, it's Galatians. To whom was this letter written? Ah, that is a contested issue because scholars do debate which Galatians are we talking about. The South Galatian theory is that he was writing to the Galatians of Iconium, Lystra, and Derby, which we read about in Acts as the places where uh, some of the places that Paul visited on his first missionary journey. The problem is that this group of people is really not, are not widely attested as Galatians. Uh, in the first century literature, other writings, not by Paul, when they referred to the Galatians, referred almost exclusively to the northern territories that, at least according to Acts, we have no evidence that Paul ever visited on his first missionary journey. And the problem is uh, Paul actually addresses the, the quote Galatians as Galatians in 3.1. And only the North Galatian area was both politically and ethnically Galatian. Galatian. On the other hand, Barnabas is mentioned in Galatians 2, 1 to 13, who would have been along on Paul's first missionary journey, but not his second. And the South Galatian theory clearly fits better with Acts than the North Galatian theory. So here is um, uh, a map that shows you roughly what we know, or I think we know, about Paul's first missionary journey. He started out at Antioch of Syria and sails over to Cyprus and then lands at Perga and goes inland um, to Antioch and then Iconium and then Lystra and, um, and then to Derby and then back and so forth. To whom was this letter written? Well, the North Galatian theory says the problem here is that neither Paul nor Acts speaks of any churches having been founded in that area. And it also requires that Paul founded churches in this area in his second missionary journey um, that are not, however, actually narrated. In other words, we know that Paul was in that area, according to Acts, but we don't know of him actually founding any churches in that area. On the other hand, the positive is that unlike the South, the North was both politically and ethnically Galatian and it would be much more natural for Paul to have called them Galatians if he's writing to people in this area. When did he write it? This was probably one of the first letters Paul wrote, perhaps even before 50 CE. Uh, the, the primary range uh, runs from about 48 to 51 and um, Probably 50 or 51 is actually a pretty good um, best guess. Here, by the way, is the uh, second missionary journey of Paul, where Paul um, again starts out in Antioch, but goes overland to Tarsus, where he grew up, and then Derby and Lystra, and, and then to the north, where uh, you can see Galatia is represented there. Um, maybe. We don't know. I mean, we just know that he made his way somehow from Lystra to Troas. So he might have visited that area, which is what this map is suggesting with those curves to the north there. And then he travels around finally to Corinth and then sails 
to Ephesus and then back eventually to um, Jerusalem and then makes his way to Antioch. Uh, and just to stick with the theme here before we return to Galatians, Paul's third missionary journey begins again in Antioch, goes over land and visits, um, visits these places before ending up in Jerusalem where he's actually arrested and never makes it back home again to Antioch. The distinctive features of Galatians, the mood of this letter is intense. Paul is fit to be tied. This is not a staid book and Paul doesn't mince words in this letter. The integrity of the gospel is at stake and for that matter, Paul's own integrity. Uh, its rhetoric is emotional and polemical from its beginning. This is the only letter of Paul not to have a thanksgiving. And instead of giving thanks for the Galatians, Paul curses them, calls them fools, wishes those who causing the trouble among them would castrate themselves. And uh, so, yeah, Paul is hot. Galatians has been called the great manifesto of Christian freedom in the New Testament. I think probably rightly so. It is the most difficult of the uncontested letters of Paul to match up with Acts. Uh, we already talked about the problem with the North Galatian versus South Galatian theory. Uh, secondly, if Galatians 2 is talking about the Jerusalem Council that we also know about in Acts 15, which is what I think, it does so with a different perspective, with different memories of what happened. I think there's actually evidence in Galatians that Paul had a different memory of what happened than some others. And, uh, but this is, this is highly contested, and I know of scholars, including the author of the Galatians Commentary in the Believer's Church Bible Commentary series, George R. Brunk III, who doesn't agree with me on that. Like other letters, the major themes in the letter are previewed in the greetings. So the greetings are really a, a handy place to say, uh, is, are there clues here in terms of what this letter is about? And indeed there are. First of all, right from the get-go, Paul claims to be an apostle. This is the most authoritative title in the early church. Paul is claiming his authority and claiming it strongly. Second, Paul's commission and authority come straight from God. They are not mediated through any human authority. So don't second guess God. Paul is an apostle called by God. Uh, so get over it. Third, Christ died to free us from the present evil age. So freedom becomes an important theme according to the will of God and the Father. This is not some human doctrine here, but this is the will of God that Christians enjoy freedom, freedom from the law especially. The source and integrity of Paul's authority are serious and difficult issues, and it's always been difficult for the church to know how to respond to people who claim direct and independent revelation from God. Uh, in my experience, to have somebody stand up in church and say that God told me, blank, 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 um, makes me want to do some discernment. Is this truly of God, or is this a person simply uh, expounding his or her own perspectives, uh, trying to get God's backing to his or her own expect, uh, perspectives. Well, that is really a critical issue. I own, my own opinion is that the revelation of, God, of Christ to Paul uh, from God was authentic. And so I'm willing to, to give him some, some credence and uh, say, uh, you know, I do believe that this is from God. But frankly, that's, that's an important piece of discernment to, to engage in. So what's the big deal? What's the problem? Well, Paul's opponents were saying that obedience to the gospel without obedience to Torah's commandments is a superficial and distorted view of Judaism. The ultimate norm for God's righteousness and therefore for human righteousness is now, as always, Torah, that is the law of the law of Moses. You just can't be an authentic Christian without obeying the Bible. Circumcision is what separates the people of God from pagans, and as father of our faith, Abraham is the prototypical proselyte, the clear pattern for Gentiles wanting to identify as part of God's people. Just as Abraham, the Gentile, was circumcised when he became 
a, a follower of what was to become the people of Israel, the God of the people of Israel. So Galatians also need to be circumcised. Paul, however, says that justification is by faith alone. Submitting to circumcision is a sign of one's rejection of God's justification on the basis of faith. This is not some small matter because the truth of the gospel is at stake. As the father of our faith, just Abraham was justified on the basis of his faith before he was circumcised. So Abraham is really the father of all who believe, Jew and Gentile alike. Paul is rather uh, uh, amazingly turns their number one um, uh, piece of evidence. You know, this is this is uh, tagged number one in the trial. Abraham is their is their great. Uh, ace in the hole, so to speak, in talking about uh, the the um, propriety and, and necessity, absolute necessity, of circumcision. And um, Paul says, not so fast. Paul says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who are confusing you and one want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should proclaim to you a gospel contrary to, to what we proclaim to you, let that one be accursed. As we've said before, so now I repeat, if anyone proclaims to you a gospel contrary to what you received, let that one be accursed. Am I now seeking human approval or God's approval? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still pleasing people, I would not be a servant of Christ. So, Nothing less than the gospel is at stake here. It's an either or. This gospel or that one, you can't have it both ways. And Paul shouts a twice shouted anathema on anyone who would preach this other gospel. In today's colloquial English, damn them. Verse 10 shows that Paul was accused of being soft on circumcision because he was a people pleaser. After all, circumcision can be kind of painful. Um, and so Paul is just trying to be soft. He's trying to be nice. And so my paraphrase of verse 10 is, okay, what now? Now that I've just pronounced a curse on anyone who would preach this other false gospel, do I look like a people pleaser now? Huh? What do you think? He's basically saying, look, that's not what I'm into. And then later on, he says, I am not lying, verse 20 of chapter 1. Now, why did Paul swear before God that he was not lying? Well, I think this makes sense only in the context where some people say that he is lying. What kind of context would some people say that he is lying? Well, I think we have evidence here that there are other versions of this story going around. Perhaps one like the version that made its way into Acts. Um, if you ever read Galatians 1, you'll notice that Paul begins with this really white hot anger that uh, people are giving up on the gospel and this is a big theological crisis going on. And then he goes to tell a story of uh, his relationship to those in Jerusalem. And you might wonder, what in the world does Paul do that if he's, why does he tell a story if he's got a theological issue that he wants to correct? Well, the answer is that there's something very crucial about this story that speaks to the theological issue. And part of that is, Paul's own authority and his independence from the other so-called leaders of the church in terms of his understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in the midst of that storytelling, he says he's not lying. Hello? He's just telling a story, his own story. Why would he be lying? Well, here again, I think other versions of this story are going around. Paul's own story is not just an interesting illustration of something. It's not a human interest story. Paul's story and the correct details in it establish his essential theological, traditional independence from the apostles in Jerusalem. In other words, he's not secondary. He, is not, he didn't get the message that he's supposed to speak to the Gentiles from the other apostles. That's the... That's the really critical issue in Galatians. Paul does not call them false apostles. They were apostles before me, he says. He just claims that his revelation is completely independent 
from the Jerusalem authorities. So, is this the same event? If so, there are serious differences between Paul's version and Luke's version. And it's those serious differences that make some people think that, uh, no, these two uh, accounts are really about uh, different um, meetings in Jerusalem because they can't be resolved. They must have been different events. Other people would say, no, this is the same event. Paul has already intimated that there are differing contradictory versions circulating. Well, that's actually where I am. Galatians 2 treats Paul as the apostle to the Gentiles, while Paul is the apostle to the circumcision. There's no mention of any apostolic decree that we we have in uh, Acts 15, where there's some sort of a compromise statement that's forged by everybody. Paul speaks of two visits to Jerusalem. The primary issue requiring a private consultation is circumcision and the obligation to fulfill the law. Now in Acts 15, Peter is the apostle to the Gentiles and authorizes the Gentile mission, although Paul is also an apostle to the Gentiles. There are practical compromises made in an apostolic decree, although those are not, that's not the language from Acts 15, but it was uh, uh, attributed to Acts by people who like decree language. Um, Acts speaks of three Pauline visits to Jerusalem. And the primary issue in this particular event requiring a council in Jerusalem, although again, that is not language from Acts 15 even, council language, but a meeting of some kind, is circumcision and the obligation to fulfill the law. A possible solution is that Galatians 2 and Acts 15 speak of the same event, but Acts errs in placing the famine relief visit of Paul to Jerusalem before the Jerusalem council. Acts also seeks to minimize or smooth over the conflict between Paul and Peter, and uh, also the agreement that's narrated in Acts 15 was not as official or clear-cut as Luke implies. I think that's the probable answer here. Now, Judaizers, Judaizers used Abraham as their exhibit number one. He was the father of the faith, a prototypical top proselyte, God established the covenant with Abraham, and circumcision was the required symbol of that covenant. But Paul ingeniously uses this very same Abraham story as proof that God justifies on the basis of faith, not works. Some people, uh, just a few, um, are tempted to find Galatians somewhat boring. After all, we know the right answer, you know, slavery to the law is bad, grace is good, yada, yada. But in context, the early church's discernment about circumcision, which was the central symbol for men of being part of God's people, must have been incredibly difficult. And I think it's hard for us to really appreciate how difficult this issue was. And I think we're left with a most fascinating window on an incident in which the early church struggled hard to make sense of where God was at work, how God was at work, and what God was saying to the church through scripture, through their own experiences, through Paul's argumentation, through Paul's experiences. Now, in Galatians 2, we read about Cephas, who came to Antioch and ate with Gentiles, which is actually in keeping with Acts 10. However, when certain ones from James came down, he discontinued doing so, as did other Jewish Christians, including Barnabas. Now, one could say that Paul, Peter, or Cephas was just being sensitive to his context, uh, honoring the sensitivities of, quote, the weak, to use a concept from Romans 14. But Paul says, no, the truth of the gospel here is at stake. Paul is nullifying the inclusive grace of God. This is not a small pastoral issue. This is a fundamental theological issue here that can't be glossed over. Now, Paul's argument in Galatians is he wants them to carefully consider your experience, your, or the Galatians, experience of receiving the Holy Spirit. And he asks them, on what basis did you receive the Spirit? Was it on the basis of believing 
or was it on the basis of doing the works of the law? And then Paul invites them to consider carefully the example of Abraham, who was justified on the basis of his faith before he was circumcised. And Abraham, after all, was to be the source of blessing of the uncircumcised Gentiles. We know that from Genesis, not from any part of the New Testament. And the promise was to Abraham's offspring, Paul says, singular, not plural, not to his offsprings, Israel. In other words, that promise, that promise to Abraham is best understood as fulfilled in Jesus. Now, Paul has a bit of a problem, and that is, why then the law? Well, it served a temporary function, intended to restrain sin until the right time, when Jesus could be revealed. The law is to the gospel what childhood is to mature adulthood. The law is to the gospel what being a slave is to being a child and an heir. They're not opposed to each other. They're just stages in the march to freedom, each with its own time and place. But the basic theological principles are the same. Now, Hagar, who is the unchosen Gentile outsider, she's an Egyptian, is a slave and therefore represents the flesh, the present Jerusalem, and anyone bound to do the works of the law. Sarah, the chosen Jewish insider, is the free woman and therefore represents the promise, the Jerusalem above, those who live by the promise of justification by faith. Just as the fleshly child Ishmael persecuted the child of promise, Isaac, so are the fleshly children, that is, Christians who want to circumcise, persecuting the children of promise, that is, uncircumcised believing Gentiles. Note the shocking reversal of roles here. Hagar, the Gentile Egyptian, um, is representing the enslaved lawdoers. So instead of following Sarah as the, um, as the symbol of promise, Jews who claim their heritage as children of Abraham and Sarah end up playing the role of Hagar, the slave. So the true insider with God is the one who believes, not the one who does the works of the law. Those who believe are the true people of promise, the true Israel of God, regardless of whether they're Jew or Gentile, male or female, slave or free. Now, sometimes uh, Hagar, no, not Hagar, but sometimes Paul gets a bad rap for his allegory here in Galatians. Uh, and uh, his allegorical interpretation, let's say, of, G of Genesis, which is really a misnomer. There is no such thing as allegorical interpretation, and we shouldn't talk, uh, we shouldn't use that language. Allegory simply does not seek to interpret a text. Rather, allegory uses a text in a certain way to illustrate a truth known on other grounds. That's an important distinction to make. So the Hagar allegory in Galatians is not fair to either Hagar, the character, or to the text of, of, uh, of Genesis, not Galatians, the text of Genesis itself. Uh, but it's not meant to be. It's not supposed to be a uh, interpretation of Hagar or of Genesis, but rather a surprising twist of a truth known in other grounds. So what then? Does Paul's gospel lead to lawlessness? Is that, is that where we're headed? And Paul says, no, freedom is not to be an opportunity for self-indulgence. The alternative to lawlessness is faith working through love. And he actually invites people, the Galatians, to, through love, become slaves to one another. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, supports reciprocal servanthood in the body of Christ. Servanthood sometimes gets a bad rap as of late, and that's because uh, we've uh, comfortably, too easily, sort of left the reciprocal part go and uh, allowed people in positions of power and comfort to uh, uh, claim servanthood when it's really others, whether it's uh, women or um, uh, people of a, of a lower economic or social class to uh, enjoy the servanthood status. But the basic point really here is freedom. It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. And so let's not uh, quickly, in the name of religion itself, submit again to the yoke of... Now, Romans is similar to Galatians in some ways, 
and not in others. The most similar is that these are the two letters where Paul deals most directly with justification and the grounds for justification. Romans sometimes, it used to be said that Paul, Romans was Paul's theological compendium. This is where you would find the systematic theology of Paul. Uh, now everyone agrees that this is an occasional letter. Uh, and an occasional letter means a letter written for a specific occasion, for, for a specific set of um, uh, circumstances in a specific context. In other words, it's context driven not theology, abstract theology driven. There is some truth in both claims, however. We should not underestimate Romans as a statement of Paul's theology, and I'll, I'll try to say a bit more about why. Uh, and this is the letter least tied, it would seem, to congregational issues. Still, many of Paul's distinctive ideas about Jesus, the end time, wisdom, and reconciliation are at best only touched on in this letter, as Johnson, uh, our textbook, I think correctly notes. Let's begin at the end because the end is the best uh, clue that we have for the occasion of the letter. That is, why did Paul write this letter? And there are certain clues within this passage that I want to highlight here. Uh, first, he says, I desire to come to you uh, when I go to Spain. I've been hindered. And, I mean, he's trying to explain why, uh, after ignoring the Romans for so many years, he, all of a sudden he's uh, giving them some attention. Well, he says, I, I wanted to come earlier, but I've been prevented. But now I'm going to Spain, and I hope to see you on my journey and to be sent on by you once I've enjoyed your company for a little while. So he uh, says a bit more, and then in verse 28, again reminds him that I will set out by way of you to Spain. Uh, and then in verse 30, he says, he invites the Romans to join him in an earnest prayer to God on my behalf that I may be rescued from the unbelievers in Judea. Um, the context here is that there have been a number of prophecies warning Paul not to go to Jerusalem, because he'll be in danger there, and he could even be arrested. And um, Paul ignores those warnings and goes to Jerusalem anyway, and in fact was arrested in Jerusalem, although that's still a, a little bit in the future in terms of the writing of this letter. So he, you know, he wants the Romans to pray that his ministry to Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. Well, what's going on here? He doesn't say much of this in Romans, but we know from other letters that he has spent months, if not years, collecting money from all the Galatian churches um, that he founded to take them to this to take this money to the saints in Jerusalem. Must have amounted to quite a good sum, and the question is, he's he's asking the Romans to pray that this that this uh, money would be acceptable to the saints. Well, why would it not be acceptable to the saints? Um, after all, they've been suffering under uh, a famine and they are poor. We know that the, that the Jewish believers in Jesus in, in Jerusalem are poor. And this is, a, this is a big deal. Well, I think the likelihood is since especially since Luke doesn't say anything about this, uh, is that this offering, this money, was not accepted by the believers in Jerusalem. And you would ask, well, why wouldn't it have been? I think it's because both Paul and others, including the Gentiles, saw this money as a symbol of unity between the Jews who believed in Jesus and also uh, the Gentiles who believed in Jesus. And, um, and there was also a, uh, opposition, of course, to Jesus among Jews in Jerusalem that didn't believe in Jesus. And uh, so it got kind of dicey politically for the believers in Jesus in Jerusalem. So um, I, th this is a bit of an argument from silence, although I think there is actually some evidence here, especially in verse 31, 
that would suggest that Paul's uh, big effort in collecting money for the people in Jerusalem did not pan out. Paul, however that may be, whether that's a fair um, guess or inference on, on my part, at least we know that Paul would like the full moral and financial support of Rome for his trip to Spain. And to get it, he knows he must introduce himself and explain his theology as thoroughly as possible. Why would the Romans, who don't know Paul very well, he certainly didn't found this church, it's the only letter that Paul wrote to a church that he did not himself found. Um, why, would he, why would they support him? Well, they would support him only if, number one, Paul has the endorsement of others that they trust. Number two, they've come to trust Paul himself through his letters and through his personal face-to-face -face interaction with them. And number three, if they're absolutely convinced that he is representing the gospel and that the people in Spain need to hear this message and they're willing to support Paul in giving it. So in the meantime, Paul is quite concerned about his trip because it was prophesied many times that imprisonment and persecutions are awaiting him, according to Acts, and Paul sees the collection as a symbol of reconciliation from, with the Jewish Christians. This ministry probably failed and the gift rejected. Uh, if it had been accepted, it's the very kind of thing that Luke would clearly have recounted and celebrated in Acts. And so Luke's own um, silence in this regard, um, it's not surprising that we'd have Paul's silence because up till now we haven't had any letters uh, by Paul that were written um, after this time. So uh, Luke's silence suggests that maybe it didn't go so well. But Paul writes in part to seek prayer support and theological support from Rome for his important ministry in Jerusalem and more importantly, his later ministry in Spain. In the last chapter of Romans, Paul says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church at Sencria, so that you may welcome her in the Lord as is fitting for the saints and help her in whatever she may require from you, for she has been a benefactor of many and of myself as well. So we know Phoebe has been a benefactor of many, including Paul. And we know that Phoebe is traveling to Rome and uh, probably is going to do some fundraising on Paul's behalf as his emissary. So, so Paul sends this letter as a way of kind of introducing and paving the way for Phoebe so that Phoebe in return can pave the way for Paul. So Paul writes to introduce himself and his gospel, but he writes also to open the way for Phoebe so that she in turn can open the way for Paul to Spain with help from the Romans. The personal greetings are surprisingly extensive for someone who has never been to Rome. And at one time, uh, scholars thought that chapter 16 must not be authentic. Um, it must have come from somebody else because Paul was never to Rome. How does he know all these people? But actually, communication and travel in the ancient world were not as rare as one might think, and uh, people did get around some, especially those uh, who um, had some money or who were charged with certain preaching and uh, oversight tasks in the Christian church. Now, the beginning of Romans also refers to its purpose, and I would say in more theological terms. Uh, Paul says, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed throughout the world. For God, whom I serve with my spirit by announcing the gospel of his Son, is my witness that without ceasing I remember you always in my prayers, asking that by God's will I may somehow at last succeed in coming to you. For I am longing to see you so that you may share with, I may share with you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. Then he pauses, or rather that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Because Paul doesn't want to come as a know-it-all, just willing to, to do one directional sharing or whatever. Um, he's, he wants to give and receive the gifts that are present in the body. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that I've often intended to come to you, but thus far I've been prevented. 
in order that I may reap some harvest among you as I have among the rest of the Gentiles. I myself am a debtor, both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish, hence my eagerness to proclaim the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Now we have no idea who founded the church in Rome, other than it wasn't Paul. Uh, Paul already has a kind of spiritual intimacy with the church in Rome. Paul wants to reap some harvest there as he has elsewhere. He wants to share a spiritual gift with them, but he, he hesitates. He doesn't want a benefactor-dependent kind of relationship. He wants a reciprocal give-and-take mutuality. Bottom line is that Paul wants to establish and strengthen this relationship. He wants to offer his own spiritual gifts and to benefit from their spiritual gifts, which, in fact, I think is the only valid motivation for ministry. Which on its own terms, is something would be worth talking about. John Taves offers, uh, I think, a compelling bracketing chiasm in, in Romans. Uh, verse uh, 8 of chapter 1 is what he calls the A, and then B would be 9, Paul's prayer for the Romans, 10 and 11, Paul's desire to visit Rome, 13, Paul prevented from visiting Rome, 14 and 15, Paul's mission to the Gentiles. And then we have the long body of the letter. But then in 15, 14 through 33, we have sort of the reverse of what he did in chapter 1, verse 8 to 15. That is Paul's mission to the Gentiles, followed by Paul's hindering, being hindered from visiting Rome, and then Paul's uh, going to Rome after Jerusalem. And then Paul exhorts prayer for him, and uh, Paul invokes peace for the Romans. When it comes, this is possibly the heart of Romans. When it comes to being justified, that is, what does justified mean? Well, it means made right, um, put in right relationship. When it comes to being put right by God, there's no distinction between Jew and Gentile. Both alike are guilty and first of all, stand in need of being put right with God, and both are, be, are put right with God on the same basis, that is, through the faith of Jesus Christ. Obedience to the Torah won't get you there. The, the thesis statement occurs in verses 16 to 18. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith, as it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and the wickedness of those who by their wickedness suppress the truth. Now I put in here believes in brackets instead of has faith, which I think is the NRSV, because the Greek actually has the verb, not the noun. Paul is not ashamed of the gospel. Well, why not? Or conversely, why might he be? Well, this is not just the word or preaching of the gospel, but it's the power of God. It is an effective and transforming word. Uh, Paul is confident about the power of the gospel to change lives. Jews come first, but otherwise Jew and Greek are in the same boat. The gospel reveals the righteousness of God, and it is revealed by means of faith for the purpose of faith. What does this mean? Well, Possibly by means of Jesus' faithfulness for the purpose of the believer's faithfulness. It comes through faith for the purpose of faith. And the gospel reveals both the righteousness of God and the wrath of God. And uh, notice the, the reference that follow there, because I think uh, we have here in this thesis statement in verses 16 to 18, a little preview of the structure of Romans, the beginning of Romans at least. And that is from 119 to 320, it's all about the wrath of God. And that's why the basic point of 119 to 320 is why Jew and Gentile are alike, more alike than anybody would think, in terms of their need for God. All have sinned, all fall short, all need some sort of breakthrough that will allow them to be put right with God. And then in 321 to 425, we have the righteousness of God, which is revealed apocalyptically, that is revealed in the life teachings and faithfulness of Jesus. 
Jesus is the means by which God's faithfulness or justice or righteousness is revealed. So an outline. We have an opening. We have a thesis statement. We have the wrath of God. We have the righteousness of God, or we could say justice of God. And then we have the theological implications of this gospel for peace and reconciliation, for the role of sin, for the role of the law, for life in the spirit, and then for the salvation of Jew and Greek, uh, as well as for life in the community, and then some closing comments and greetings. In Romans 5 to 8, especially 5, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus. Through, uh, through Jesus. Just as Adam's sin unleashed the pervasive apocalyptic power of sin affecting all, so Jesus' faithfulness unleashed the pervasive apocalyptic power of justice affecting all. Notice the representationalism here in both Adam and Jesus. Romans 6, we've therefore died to the power of sin and are therefore free to enroll our bodies as weapons of righteousness. It's hopla in Greek, which really means wep weapons. Um, I think some translations have instruments and you wouldn't know that we're in a, a kind of a spiritual battle here that Paul is, uh, is talking about. In Romans 7, the law has played its role and that is to reveal sin as a problem that can be only be dealt with by the decisive revelation of God in Christ. But now you've died to the law and it no longer plays its primary role. We are therefore freed from condemnation, free to live in the Spirit. Now, what is the role of unbelieving Israel in God's plan? And what Paul means by Israel in these three chapters seems possibly to vary somewhat. It's a little hard to nail down and be totally consistent on this. Paul is deeply troubled at the beginning of the night. It just doesn't look good. It's not as though the word of God had failed. God is God and free to show mercy on whomever God wishes. But that doesn't let the unbeliever off the hook. The Gentiles are ironically the proper heirs of what the Jews sought, which is righteousness. And this is in some ways wonderful when it comes to the Gentiles, but it's terrible when it comes to the Jews who haven't believed in the way that the Gentiles have. Paul recapitulates his anguish over the current state of affairs and reiterates that Christ is the end, telos in Greek, of the law. Now, end in English has an ambiguity. It could mean the termination of the law, so it's no longer in effect, or it could be the goal of the law. So it is the, the, um, the end toward which the law points. And the Greek word telos has the same ambiguity. Um, although uh, I, would clearly, I would say that it's clearly not just goal, but also is a termination of some, at some level. Uh, termination in the sense of fulfillment, that it's reached its proper um, goal in the, the life of faithfulness that is, first of all, demonstrated by Jesus and also required. So that there might be righteousness for everyone who believes. Salvation is intended for all, but requires the believing response of the hearer. Now, those of you who have a NRSV, please cross out and correct the misinformed subhead in, in the NRSV at Romans 11.1 1, that says Israel's rejection is not final. Israel is not rejected in the theology of Paul, whether temporarily or permanently. Rather, God has always saved Israel by working through a remnant, and that's what's happening right now. God's work in saving the Gentiles is how God saves Israel. And the remnant of the Gentiles shows that God has not rejected Israel, and the whole history of Israel shows that God saves Israel by working through a remnant. God has grafted in the Gentiles and removed the grounds of boasting for both Jew and Gentile. Paul is confident that in the end, Israel will come to its senses, become jealous of the Gentiles, and leave. Now, too often, Romans 12 to 15 is separated completely from Romans 1 to 11. Uh, one way of looking at the structure of Romans is that the mercies of God are expounded in Romans 1 to 11, and uh, then we have the implications or the response of humans to, that, to those mercies in the more ethically related 12 to 15. 
Not thinking more highly of oneself than one ought to think is a matter of community life, which is the main theme in Romans 12 to 15, but it's also aimed at the Jew who's tempted to boast over the Gentile, as well as the Gentile who's tempted to boast over the Jew. Paul had problems with both of these issues. Not boasting over others is actually at the heart of the reconciling good news. In the body of Christ, in the community of faith, we belong to each other and we experience the grace of God through gifts of the Spirit operating reciprocally. Boasting is excluded. Self-justification is out. So what do we have with a, a summary here of Paul? Jesus revealed himself to Paul in a powerful, life-changing experience while Paul was persecuting believers in Jesus, ironically. And he had, as a result, a powerful conversion. It's not a, a conversion to Christianity, but rather a conversion to God. Uh, and see Acts 9 for that. Jesus is God's Messiah. That's the heart of it. And in fact, Jesus is God's agent in reconciling all humanity. Paul spent a long time by himself in Arabia, possibly Mount Sinai, working out his understanding of what God is doing in the world. Paul was certainly a creative theologian, articulating an inclusive gospel that is both Jew and Gentile are saved on the same basis, not a conservative, stern lawgiver, as some people, some Christians are apt to think of Paul. In some ways, Paul was a good role model as pastor theologian, but he also had a big ego and was times a prickly colleague. And um, for all of his brilliance, I'm just as happy I didn't have, I don't have Paul as a pastor now. Paul's ministry and writings are best understood as working out the implications of this re revelation of God to Paul uh, for life and faith. The works of the law can only bring condemnation. It was necessary for a time, but its positive role was temporary while pointing and leading to Christ. Justification by faith, this concept, is old. It's been around ever since Abraham. This is not a new concept that Paul is proclaiming. God's new revelation in Christ shows how faith or faithfulness or trust is and always been the means to right relationships.